Up rating is high because the curbs are aggressive. And the tyre wear, we don't actually know because we haven't used the soft tyre here before. A whole new world to unpack and unfold. And the most number of laps that we've seen have been in the teens. Yep. And they've got to do 78 of them today. Now, conventional wisdom is that you might break the race when you've got a compulsory two-stop scenario into three pieces. How you do that and how far you can stretch the tyres is going to be an interesting and somewhat unanswered question, remembering that we lost 30 minutes on Thursday to wet track conditions. Oh, sadly, they've had to take Cam's car off the grid and bring it back into the lane. Not a good start for him for Matt Stone Racing. Great to see so many people here all around this wonderful Adelaide Parklands precinct and really hats off to the organisers here who've done just a beautiful job of presenting this facility. Huge investment by the South Australian Government. So it'll be 24 cars that greet our starter. And that's the scenario, Cropper. Is the left-hand side better than the right? I think the right-hand side's better, where David Reynolds is parked. Cleaner. Yep. Front row of the grid, Brody Kostecki and David Reynolds. Row two, Thomas Randall, Anton Di Pasquale. This is going to be a mega, mega moment. Today's headline story is Van Gisbergen versus Kostecki. There is a title bout to decide. Is today the day? Go for part one of the Adelaide 500 and a great start by Brody. And they bump and grind their way to turn one with Reynolds up on the outside being forced into a yield. It was a bad start, weirdly, there for Van Gisbergen. The jump from the start was brilliant by Brody, but the secondary part of the start was better by David. But very high risk bumping. On the line, in the fence! In the fence! So Will Brown and I think Shane Van Gisbergen have actually made contact. So that's Will Brown in the fence on the left-hand side coming out of turn four. But I think he got Shane at the same time. Wow. Safety car boards and flags on the opening lap between turns four and turn five. Of race 27, there has been heavy contact involving the championship contender, this man, Shane Van Gisbergen, and Will Brown with big damage on the back of the Coke car. And that is a sad sight for the left front corner of the Van Gisbergen car. That's looking like it could be all out. And I think there was contact with Anton Di Pasquale to start that. I think that's where it come from. Anton was on the inside. It ricocheted Will wide, and he was caught in it because of the bad start, Neil. And leaping out of the car, big damage on the front of Will's car there. So a great initial jump by Kostecki. And, uh, and then the secondary part of that start meant that he was almost under threat by Reynolds by the time they got down to turn one and then David was on the wrong side of the road. But how's this for a story? Only seconds old into the race. We jump on board now with Reynolds. Very good start. And Brody's trying to give himself some space to open up the line into the corner. You can see that David's compromised on the right side of the road. And in the end, he just yields. Now look further back in the pack. Bad start, Ben Gisbergen. Yep. So he's lost a spot by the time they get down to turn one. He stayed up high on the outside. Had to straight line the chicane out the other side. Now keep an eye when they get up here into the braking area. So that's Anton. Who makes There's... contact with Brown. And yeah, and Shane had nowhere to go. He's just an unwitting victim in the whole thing. Just clips him on the way by. So you got that 100%. On board here with Will Brown, turn one. Highly congested part of the racetrack here on the opening lap and on a cold tyre, it's difficult to negotiate. So that's Deep Squally just in front of him. He covers down the inside. Will's trying to make ground. Up on the outside, gets squeezed here. Bang, contact. Heavily into the wall. So he gets, he eats concrete on the left and gets Van Gisbergen on the right. So here it is again from external, turn four. So they interlock wheels, fires Will into the road, and that catches Van Gisbergen and effectively ends his day. And Shane had nowhere to go. Absolutely nowhere to go. On board now. This is Cam Waters in the foreground. And the push and shove's happening up here at turn four. We're with Shane. Bang, bang. 
nowhere to go. In fact, the Mustang in front, Camp Waters, blocked his vision completely, didn't it? Because when you were on board just then, oh. you didn't even see that Will went in. Oh. That, that went in hard. Yeah, that's a nasty shunt. Nasty for two reasons, because the right rear got monstered and savaged, and then it goes headlong into the wall. So, so it hits the tyres initially, but the wall's just after yeah, it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so that's going to have pretty significant damage to deal with. And then it's bitten this car. And Van Gisbergen literally had nowhere to go. And he's out of action. Andrew Edwards knows the story. Under investigation, race control confirming that the contact between cars 9, 11, 97, lap 1, turn 4 uh, will be considered... Shane heads back into the garage. And there's not much you can say. He's pulled a couple of gears and got up there to turn four and it's game over. That was not in the script. It's cruel, isn't it? I mean, you can put yourself in the wrong spot at the wrong time, but that wasn't the case at all. He was just completely blindsided by what had gone on in front of him. And when that car popped out, of the fence, he was just in behind, had absolutely no way of first seeing it and then secondly reacting to miss it. Meantime, at the other end of the field, Brody Gostecki did survive the attack on the run down to turn one. He has the lead, we're under safety car until we can get all this cleaned up and uh, they're working away also on the pen right entry in there of Matt Payne, who's got tangled in that. So the order, in a wild start to this race, Kostecki, Reynolds and Randall. One, two and three. Bill Brown watching in the Coca-Cola racing garage. What a frustration. It's just an awkward one. We've seen it a couple of times this year where wheels have interlocked and cars just fire off in any direction. So this is the Cam Hill car that we saw stranded at the pre-start as well. And that's Paul Martin, who you commented had the helmet cam on for the start. He's actually the acting head of motorsport this weekend for supercars. And he's just now liaising with the truck assist team and Matt Stone Racing, Cam Hill, to have that car come back out into the race. Obviously, it'll be down in terms of lap number, but they're just trying to ensure that he can rejoin at the back of this train of cars. You know what I find amazing is that it doesn't matter how many permutations you go through in your mind of all of the different things that may or may not happen. Mark Larkham detailed at pre-race. This could happen, that could happen. He's in front of this, that happens, these points. There's nothing that ever prepares you for the random nature of the game. No. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to write that in to go, this is what was going to happen up there at turn four. That a couple of cars that really had nothing to do with Van Gisbergen make contact and then Van Gisbergen's just caught on the left side of the road in effectively the wreckage from that process. And there is the car that's sadly on the back of the flatbed truck. So now we just have to get this thing going once again and see whether or not Reynolds and Randall have got any firepower here for Kostecki. The other part too, Neil, you probably find that we didn't actually see again, we saw it once, was the onboard of Will Brown, but you probably find the steering forces for Will Brown when he went in that fence would be pretty extreme because he had no bearing. He didn't know that that wall was jutting out in that area and it was originally into the tyres, but as you made the point, it actually made contact heavily with the concrete wall on the left. Yeah, it's the headbutt in the secondary part of that incident that looked really ugly. So that, that there... Yeah, where it juts out. Bang. Yeah, so the left front corner of that car has taken a monster beating, let alone the shark bite in the right rear corner. So there are the two stricken cars. That's Van Gisbergen's car at turn five. Here's the onboard with Will. Anton Di Pasquale, he ranges up. It's typical, normal deal to go to the inside, protect into turn four. Will reacts to that, tries to get round the outside, and then... Oh, Those steering forces are very high. Heavy battery not shot. to have really very, very sore hands or wrists. That's, uh, that's a much bigger shunt than you think because you're not ready for it. Century batteries chop a shot 
looking over the Adelaide Parkland circuit where we were under safety car and we only got a quarter of a lap of racing done before there was an incident up at turn four on the exit and that has claimed Shane Van Gisbergen. And now good news here is that Cam Hill is back out on the racetrack in the truck assist entry. So both Will Brown and Shane Van Gisbergen victims in that incident. We'll get more from Jack Perkins. Will Brown, I was only chatting to you on the grid about five minutes ago, talking up the race, and now it's hit the showers early, mate. Talk us through what happened there on the first lap. Yeah, I haven't even worked up a sweat yet. Um, it's just one of those things. Everyone block blocks on the inside, and if you can't make it up the inside, you know everyone banks up. So I went for the outside. I knew I had good overlap. I would have tucked him behind him if I wasn't, you know, at least uh, completely next to him. And uh, I thought he'd be able to see me and knew I was completely there. But, um, yeah, obviously not. I'm not going to judge it too much, you know. Probably just thought he'd run me a little bit wide and then, um, yeah, I ended up in the fence that hard and unfortunately took out one of the championship leaders as well. So, tough day. I think we had a fast car for today. It's, it's a bit disappointing, but um, in the end, that's racing. There's not much I can do about it. We just watched the highlight together from your J-Car helmet cam. How are your hands, mate? You're hanging onto the steering wheel at the point where it's got reefed out of your hands. Talk us through that. Yeah, my left hand was quite sore. It's a little bit sore now, but it's not too bad. Obviously, the car's completely... Uh, damaged I won't say the word I was gonna use so um yeah it's really disappointing obviously Shane just couldn't see when Cam was there and just ran up the back of me so um yeah disappointing I think uh probably should have been left a little bit more room there I, I reckon I was completely um up the outside and he could see me but is what it is will you go and have words with Anton after the race or just let it be no nah, Anton's not a bad bloke he probably just uh you know everyone does that every now and then it is what it is all right, mate. Well, you'll be cheering on Brody from the, the same seats here as a crew. All the best. Uh, hopefully they get it out tomorrow. Yeah, hopefully we can. Cheers, Jacko. Updating Matt Payne's number 19 Penrite Racing Mustang. And you can see here on the rear quarter panel and on the wheel where he's actually made heavy contact with the wall on the outside of turn three. So completely separate to what we saw happening with Will Brown, Anton Di Pasquale and Shane Van Gisberg. And Payne just rubbed the wall for the run up to turn four and has date bent the rear toe link. So the rear geometry and rear suspension on this car heavily bent. So the team working hard to get it back out there and get some points more so towards the team's championship for this team. And a bit of confusion up here for Truck Assist Racing with Cam Hill. They actually did an engine change prior to this race, but the car just wouldn't fire on the grid. Wasn't a starter motor, wasn't a battery issue. So a little bit of scratching heads here, and then there was a bit of confusion as to Thank whether they car. could actually Lights take the start of this race. So he's out there now. Let's see what happens. And we're going to get a restart next time around as Will's car comes back into the pit lane area. And look at the damage on the right rear corner of it. Uh, pretty savage, and uh, it'll be the left front corner that they'll have to do a lot of work on tonight as well. That's a very heavy contact with that wall where it just juts out after the tyre barrier. So brody has got control of the field, and they're about to be released to give us some green flag racing again. Then it's Reynolds, Randall, Di Pasquale, who was in the wars down there with Will Brown in position number four. Then Waters, Mostert, Golding, Feeney, Davison and Courtney now in the top 10 with the Matt Payne car, as Garth was just explaining, still back in the garage. And uh, now a couple of laps adrift. Brody's got control of the field. SC car has come back in now. They'll have all worked pretty hard to try and make sure that they could maintain what little they had in the way of tyre pressure and temperature because remember they were barely racing. We get stuck into it one more time. It's going to be a long, busy afternoon. Brody covers quite aggressively to make sure that there's no incentive at all for Reynolds, who's actually made a bit of ground there. So he's trying to search for a way by at the moment, out of turn five. Brody covering again. Clean to start these first couple of corners. They'll all be just starting to get a bit of a feel for what have I got for balance and grip here. What am I dealing with? Quite a bit of direct light on the racetrack at the moment. Meantime, race control confirming that there's no further action after the incident up at turn four on the opening lap, which will be considered a racing incident. Thomas Randall just jinxed to the right and had a bit of a peep down the inside. Meantime, Golding having a look. Didn't quite get there. Thought about it with Chaz. Back to turn 11. This is the race lead. Just stick in Reynolds. We're riding with David. Turn 13 in behind the pit paddock. Now Brady's just opened up the margin as Matt Payne rejoins. 
great frustration for him given the pace that he's shown so far this weekend. Good battle going on just in behind there. It looked like David Reynolds come off the first chicane really well at the restart and was very, very fast through turn three, which forced Brody to block pretty heavily up here at the end of Wakefield Street. I think Brody's just being a little conservative on this opening lap just to make sure that he brings everything up sensibly, doesn't make a mistake. David's energised by the opportunity right now, whilst his car probably feels a little better. He's trying to make a little move, a little opportunistic move. If Brody leaves a hole. Both the Mustangs in position two and three are showing good pace out there at the moment. Randall's just gone quicker in both the first two sectors than the two guys in front. Because Reynolds just searches high and low at the moment to see whether or not he can prize open a gap. Oh, James Courtney just being displaced there briefly. Brock Feeney is in the sole remaining Red Bull car out there. We're on board now with James. I think he's got Nick Percat behind him at the moment. So something weird happened then because I think Feeney actually has come up as a consequence, but yeah, he's come up six spots. And Will Davison moved up a spot there, so there must yeah. have been a bit of congestion there, but they're all sorting themselves out. Had a bit of a conversation with Will this morning just about trying to find the sweet spot in that number 17 Shell V-Power Racing Team entry. It's proven to be a little bit of a setup challenge for him this weekend to get it to his liking and break confidence is something that he hasn't been entirely happy with. Scott Pye having a look up the inside here. He's challenging Tim Slade. Slade's covering pretty aggressively there, and he's doing it again. And Scott, who has done a deal with all the changes in the landscape for 2020 for the Cars Championship, Scott has announced that he won't be with Team 18, but he's going to take up a co-driver role at Red Bull Ampole Racing. And at the moment, he doesn't care at all about what that car looks like for this, the end of this weekend. He'll be pressing on pretty hard. Slade and Pine, a couple of South Australians, proudly racing in their home state this weekend. Now, Brody's settled into the groove now, and just on that last lap, he's opened up a margin. It's half a second on the clock, and he's done the fastest lap of 121.1. So there was a bit of early pressure there from David, but I think it might have also been a case of just looking after tyres there. This is what happened... We caught the aftermath of this after Will had gone by Brock, and that invited James to the party. A little bit of brake locking into that final corner. We've seen a pile of that this weekend. And quite sensitive to be able to stop and turn down there at that part of the racetrack. Cam Waters, Boston, Golding, Davison, Feeney, Courtney, Percat. Pace of the first four cars, very, very equal. So Kostecki, Reynolds, Randall and Deep Pasquale, that little squad of four cars at the front there, those numbers almost identical. And they're just pulling back from each other just a little bit, just for brake and engine temperatures. Don't need in the early stage of a race like this to have any overheating or any drama. It's not worth having any reliability or potential issue when you've got 78 laps to go and we're only eight laps in. So at the moment, Kostecki with half a second lead over Reynolds from Randall, Dick Pasquale, Waters, Mostert, Golding, Davison. Thomas Randall's potentially on to make a new fastest lap here on this lap. He's gone really quick in the first sector. Pretty decent number in the mid sector as well. And so the current trend is that uh, may well go on with it. No, he didn't in the end. He lost a little bit of ground in the third sector. So he's also swallowing some hot air there at the moment. His best lap was that last lap. It was a 20.9. A bit of traffic effect and a bit of temperature to deal with in that process. Mark Winterbottom in this queue, sitting in 16th, still in behind his teammate there, Scott Pye in the Toyota Forklift Century. Oh, big dive. Big lunge there. So that was the move finally that Scott Pye put on Tim Slade and then his teammate as Scott Pye escorted Tim Slade just a little bit wide his teammate was able to capitalise Mark Winterbottom in behind there, they had a little bit of contact off the back of the kerb 
Got away with it. So Reynolds is now He's pushed up again. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? A little bit of an elastic gap going. Mm. Point three eight of a second it is. And on that lap, uh, Thomas just lost a little bit of ground back there in third. And if anything, he's fallen a little more into the clutches of Deep Squally, who's not showing any after effects from the contact with Will Brown, because that was the other thing I raised my eyebrow. I wondered whether that car 11 had taken a bruise as a result of the contact up at four on the opening lap. Yeah, I actually thought there might have been damage on the uh, exhaust outlet on the Shelby Power Mustang, so we'll have a closer look at that when the pit stops start unfolding. But yeah, to your point, I thought when the side-to-side -side contact happened and never knowing how much wheel force you've got going, it looks like it's pretty clean there on that exit, exhaust exit, looks like it's okay. There is a mark on the sill, but you'd expect that with the side-to-side -side contact. And race control now confirming that the window for the compulsory stop is now open should anybody want to take it. That gets delayed when there's a safety car intervention as there was today in the opening lap. Reynolds just having a peep, looking high and low to see whether or not he can force a margin. Gives you a bit of an idea as to where all the various drivers that you may be cheering for are parked in the field here at the moment. Two BJR cars side by side into that hairpin at turn nine. Meantime, Matt Payne, who went back out there behind the play, five odd laps. He's just gone faster in both sectors one and two with fresh air around him, and he's probably on target to grab the fastest lap. So we know that's a quick car. He's been practicing and qualifying well, not just here, but on the Gold Coast as well. Shame he's not been able to fully show it. Point four of a second officially on the computer timing, that margin between Kostecki and Reynolds. Randall just drifted ever so slightly, and he's not far away from Di Pasquale. Been one or two little battles back in this group as well that have now resolved themselves. Things just settling slightly. Declan Fraser having a look up on the inside of Bryce Fullwood. Problem with that is that it doesn't translate when you get to turn five. I've yeah. never fully noticed that angle of the return wall on the exit of turn four down there before that we saw in the Will Brown incident either. So now that I'm aware of it, you see when they do negotiate turn four, you think, OK, carefully if you end up hung out there. Yeah, I think it's actually because it's a little side street or laneway there. That's why the the wall profile is different. So we can put a bit of that later on. Uh, and to your point earlier there, Matt Payne has done the fastest lap with a 20.69 when he's come back out of the pit. So the wheel alignment that the boys did down there at Penrite Racing has been effective and he's been able to come straight out and show the pace that he's been showing all weekend. And in recent past, pretty much everywhere we've gone, Matt Payne, as a debutante in our series this year, has been tremendously impressive. Battle here with Courtney and... Hazelwood. These guys battling for 11th and 12th at the moment, and Todd putting a lot of pressure on James. And he may have to cover here because Todd looked like he got a pretty decent exit out of the chicane right with him. So that's that little wall there, just on the exit of turn four. Randall, meantime, faster in sector one on this lap than the rest of the field. And he just did his personal best lap of the 20.8, Thomas Randall. So he's starting to claw a tiny bit of that margin that I said had opened up. It's now crushed back down a little bit again as he tries to shake loose Deep Squally. A lot of cat and mouse going on in the early part of the race here at the moment, trying to figure out how hard to push, but not push too hard that you hurt the tyres and you pay the price because you need to do a pretty decent stint on these tyres. So, Neil, let's have a quick look uh, so folks at home can see the extent of damage on Shane Van Gisbergen's car now. They don't want us to show us the suspension for obvious reasons, but it's ugly under there. In fact, they haven't even got the wheel off yet. It got punched so hard. But what I do want to show you, up in here, if we come right around here, Pete, look over the other side of the inner wheel well there. The shock absorber's broken and punched all the way. It's come through here into the engine bay. So, look, they're not going to get this repaired and out and try and gather up some points later in the race. I might slip through here so I can get a quick word with Jamie Winkup, get his reaction to that, because that's uh, really unfortunate. Oh, sorry, Jamie, if I could just grab a quick word. What a 
what a devastating way to end the day. But you've been around the game a long time, mate. You know how it works. Yeah, hundred percent. It was um, it was unfortunate there. Shane was just blind coming out of turn four, um, and there's a parked car in, in Will Brown. So thankfully, no one got hurt, and it's not. A it's quite a bit of damage to both cars, but um, we'll certainly be able to get them both out for tomorrow. It's the story of our game, though, isn't it, mate? You really needed, you know, Brody back in the pack because it goes to show you're only going to be back a couple of rays and you're in the danger zone. 100%. And of course, it was unfortunate, but when you qualify 6 and 11, then you've, you, you're exposed to stuff like this happening, and, and that's what happened. So um, we'll see what we'll see, but it's pretty much all done for us, unfortunately. Bad luck and best luck tomorrow. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks. Third of a second, the gap, Kostecki over Reynolds now as we ride with him again. That's interesting, isn't it? Looking down towards the southeast there at the moment. It was quite dark, but it tends to be that way over the top of the Adelaide Hills and out near Mount Lofty. When you look out the other direction towards the water, it doesn't look quite so bad. But we've had this threat yesterday and today that there might be the chance of some light showers, a bit of drizzle here and there. There were one or two spits just prior to the start of the Dunlop Super 2 race didn't really eventuate but it is ever present at the moment it's been uncharacteristically cool just for the last several days so the pressure's back on here again now doesn't matter what the computer timing says because Reynolds is in a position to be able to launch an assault here turn seven and we'll try to stay close to this battle with the run up here this is a good look at what the comparison is for a very fast turn eight. He's come through there very well. In fact, he's in a spot. He could have a dive if he was here. Yeah, looks like he's going to, and he has. So that was a good run. It was. So a very, very nice run through the middle of that corner, and the aero effect was not substantial enough to hurt the momentum that Dave Reynolds had, and he came through there beautifully. He was able to run off there two or three K faster than what Brody was able to exit at, and down the inside he went. GT? Barry Ryan has been able to pry his eyes away from the TV screen for just long enough to have a chat to us. Baz, let's talk about the start. Brody got the launch off the line to get Dave Reynolds into the first chicane. It felt like 200 metres down the road. The other car was in a whole heap of trouble. Do you want to give us your view on the Will Brown and Tom DeBasquale moment? I didn't really hear you, but, um, yeah, it's just unfortunate for Will's car. But, um, yeah, lucky one of the Red Bull cars out as well. So for the team's championship, it's still OK, but... Now Brody's just going to finish the race, so no, I don't really care if he comes last down as long as he wins the race. Does this, you know, does ask you, does, does this change after that moment when Shane was taken out of the race? Does it change the mindset for this race? Does it change how you go about things this afternoon? No, we still want to win, but you saw then he's not going to fight. Like he knows now, he's just got to finish to wrap up the championship. So you know he's, he's a smart enough guy. He's just going to cruise around and do what he needs to do and keep it safe. Uh, have you had any reports back about the Will Brown car? What sort of condition that's in? Will it be out tomorrow? I think it's going to test the team. I think it's going to be the biggest Gen 3 repair so far. So I'm tipping an all-nighter, but we'll get it fixed no matter what. Good luck stuff, Nita. Thanks, mate. Yeah, that contact on the rear and then the heavy contact on the front means that they will have a busy night as Mark Winterbottom makes a lunge here on Scott Pye and a successful one. Gets it down the inside. So Deep Pasquale taking a stop while the conversation was unfolding. That'll be to try and get some undercut benefit. He's taken some fuel in that process. And uh, that was around about 21 odd litres on our numbers. So that'll give him a bit of clear track to operate in, which will be the great advantage of that stop. That was a nice move by Reynolds. He got very cleanly through turn eight and you can see the speed carry out the other side and that perfectly set up the opportunity to be able to sneak down the inside. Here it is again on the replay. Turn eight, good pace through there, excellent exit. And that tiny bit of extra momentum is all you need. And then Brody wasn't having a bar of the notion of putting a scratch on the coat car. And he lets him rock on by. Under the circumstances, it's completely understandable. And as Barry said, the thought process now for Car 99 and Brody Kostecki as the championship leader is to ensure that they don't make any silly mistakes. Alison McVeigh there clapping. Brett McPherson in behind. Understanding that the win they had on the Gold Coast was a very big moment for the team and that now is essentially the same battle unfolding on the streets of Adelaide. And a nice move by David Reynolds up the inside but very early days. We're only in 17 laps of 78 
and Brody won't go away. He's very competitive, we know that. And Thomas Randall's not going anywhere also. So Randall has the lead Tickford car just in front of his teammate with the revised livery this weekend as a tribute to Ken Block and even changed that number from car six to 43. The car looks fantastic as we see this battle that's been going on now for a fair few laps. Rob Feeney in behind Will Davison. Brock seems to be able to use about half a car width less road on the exit. His momentum in the middle of the corner in those 90s looks a little bit better. But the exit drive traction is the thing that is hurting him. You can just see there the Shell V-Power car. Once they got through the middle of the corner and into the exit stage of the corner, Will Davison was able to put the power down and be able to march away from Brock. What tends to happen around this layout is when you make a car pointy and good for those 90 degree corners through four, five, six and seven, doesn't necessarily mean that they accelerate that well off the slow corners because they require different things. The front of the car determines so much of the mid corner for those 90 degree corners, but the rear of the car is such a big asset in terms of drive traction and how it puts its power down coming out of corners like this. Turn 14, turn 11, turn 9, turn 7. So often the speeds of the cars over the complete lap are very close to each other, but they achieve their speed quite differently. Sunday race winner here last year, Feeney in. Taking him out of the traffic jam. Got a lot of fuel there for that amount of time stationary. And they'll be looking for Anton, so there he goes, straight yep. by. So they didn't want to get caught up in that. What was the number between them? Would you say 21 litres for I think Anton? Was, yeah, just over 20 odd litres. And, 17, uh, uh, almost 18 on our numbers for Feeney. So their second stops, so they'll have to sit stationary for quite some time to get the rest of the fuel load on. The mandate is that they must take on 100 litres of fuel. Now what this also means is that Brock gets a bit of fresh air to deal with for a while as well. He's up at turn seven at the moment. There's really nobody much around him and in front of him as you saw in the rejoin, Anton's got empty space around him too. So just keep an eye on those guys. That could work for them a little bit later on. I'm keeping a little bit of an eye at present on what's going on with lap speed. So Reynolds on the last lap, for example, did a 20.9, and his best is a 20.79. So, so far, there's not been anything much in the way of a drop-off. Mark Winterbottom in, the DeWalt entry on the right side of screen. It's a 21.4 on the last lap for Kostecki, and a 21.2 for Randall. So that pace of Reynolds is, is a long way up the road. In fact, Will Davison just did his fastest lap of the race, he's done a 20.9, that's right on the money with what Reynolds is doing. But to your point with clear track, Deep Pasquale did a 20.47 as the fastest lap of the race so far. So him being out on his own, that will serve him well with the undercut. So will Feeney do a similar thing. The problem is that you, you park for a long time. Change for position number two now. Thomas Randall moves up one spot. No risks being taken at all by Brody Kostecki. Not too far behind now is Cam Waters. You saw a glimpse of the roof line on that car. There he is in the background running car number 43 this weekend. So not a lot of fight, not elbows up for Brody here at the moment. He's just making sure that there's no risk. Here's the manoeuvre. Nicely executed, very similarly actually to the Reynolds pass. And as you can see, Brody just parks it slightly wide, gives him more than a car width to play with. No contact, nicely executed. And here comes James Courtney. So uh, both Reynolds and Waters on the last lap were quite quick with their times in the low 21s. Please let me drop. Wait for the field going on there for James. So, looking at the last lap speed order, your point from before was that Will Davison was very fast, so was Brock Feeney. And the fastest car again 
looking at those numbers, Deep Squally very, very quick, so was Reynolds. Reminder that the fuel flow refill rates are around about 2.3 litres per second of the BP75. So when they have those short, sharp stops, what they're doing is they're, they're ticking one of the compulsory stops off and getting it out of the way. They take a little gulp of fuel, but they're trying to get track position and some empty track to see whether or not they get some undercut benefit. And then uh, they can hedge against the possibility of a safety car later on as Will Davison now comes in in the Shelby Power Racing Team entry. But they'll be sitting still for a lot longer a bit later in the day. Here comes Will. So all eyes focused on the team's championship battle here now, knowing that if things stay as they are, and there's no drama for Brody Kostecki, and he just comes home, he's got this thing nicely wrapped up with a little bow on it. And David's gone out to a 2.2 second lead over Thomas Randall, and it's 3.2 seconds now between Brody Kostecki and third. And and David in the lead, David Reynolds. These two blokes were battling before those stops. So Feeney's trying his hardest there to have a dive because he knows that whilst Davison's tyres are cold and he's battling for tyre pressure as Will runs him wide, tries to flick around the other way. He's going to do the crisscross and get down the inside at seven here. Can he get down there? Will turns across. He's going to give him a bump. And now... It's a drive traction battle again that we saw from the aerial shot earlier. And once you get a couple of corners away, get some temp and pressure going in the tyres in car 17, eventually Will gets a traction benefit. That's why Brock is hustling so hard. And Will covers again down the inside. It's right in the middle of the road. And he tries to round him up and go the long way here. So Kostecki's come in for his first stop. So he's out of the queue. Keeping an eye on the battle at turn 11. Will Davison still hanging on. And that seemed like a fair drink of fuel. Yeah. So the 100 litres compulsory fuel drop. We've already seen early numbers under 20 litres. And for Kostecki, what number will we get there? It's actually not that much more. It's 26 litres on our numbers. So it looked like it was in there for a lot longer than that. Golding was the one that's probably put the most amount of fuel in looking at that there. It's uh, almost 50 litres for Golding. So he's the real one out there with a chunk of fuel. So is Bryce Forward. Forward just over 60 litres of fuel. So there'll be a bit of frustration inside the helmet there at Brock Finney because he knows that those first few corners when Will was vulnerable was the moment. And now he's probably going to get fed up looking at the rear wing of that car for a few laps to come. And he was right there before the stops. So they battled before the stops. As it turned out, they put almost the same amount of fuel yeah. on as each other. And they've come out line of stern. Which is handy when whichever of the opposing teams gets the ability to know what the other one did. So you can match your fuel numbers or slightly undercut if you want to hold your track position. Reynolds is now out to two and a half seconds. And he's got a, a nice rhythm going out there at the moment. Reynolds, Randall, Waters, Mostert, Percat having a good solid run. And Todd Hazelwood, South Australian boy as well. He's up in the top six here. The first of the Camaros sitting in that seventh position, Heimgartner. Then it's LeBrock, Pye, Slade. I think they've just called Hazelwood in on this lap. There he is on screen, the red arc entry. It's good, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks excellent. They're always faster when they're red. <laughs> Ferrari have been adhering to that for a long time. And Nick Perkett, who's having his last run. So both those boys are having their last runs this weekend with their respective teams. In the case of Perkett, he'll be moving to Matt Stone Racing. It's the last one for him, Walkinshaw and Reading United. And we're not sure of the plans here for Todd Hazelwood. And yes, he has been called and responded. Remember I said in the Hino Hub earlier today how tricky it is to get into that pit lane because he comes through turn 13 at a huge rate of knots. Got to get the thing stopped and not climb that wall.
go, 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 Hazelwood as he departs. He's got Pi also coming down the lane and behind. So there's only 10 cars in the field now that haven't taken their stop. Oh, that was awkward for Hazelwood. He's got cold tyres on it and he's trying to squeeze that thing's by our throat and he's got it by the neck and he only just got away with that. Because oh, this could be shades of what happened at the start of the race as Golding was trying to find a way round. So that was pretty wild. Now there's a dive bomb down the inside, and this time Golding gets it done. So Todd did everything he could. It was a valiant attempt to try and cling on. It's a pretty vigorous racing. Now Thomas Randall has responded now, and he's into the pit lane. That brings Waters up into position number two, and that leaves a three and a half second margin between Reynolds and Waters. Thomas in. They dragged him across very late, didn't they? So that must be because of the walk to and Gritty United car. That's being serviced, yes, that car. Yeah. Couldn't work out why okay, it's such a late turning. Hands on for position. That's how that's our advantage. And the position here is really important. They're trying to tell him about what it really looks like in terms of pace, because remember, before the stops, they were like this. <laughs> and it's still going on. Anton thought about it and then uh, positioned back to the right-hand side then. <laughs> Great battle going on here between these fellas. 3.3 seconds though at the lead. The margin is tightening ever so slightly between Reynolds and Waters just in this last half lap. And Thomas parked him. Yeah. So he, when he was right behind him, he slowed the exit up and Anton didn't have anywhere to go. And because these things have got so much power, he can make the rear tyre energise pretty quickly and get it up to temperature pretty quickly. So he just did that on purpose and then drove away from him. So Thomas Randall, nice racecraft there, a little bit of gamesmanship just to keep Anton Di Pasquale there. And as he was reminded on the way out of the pit that he's got 10 lap fresher tyres than Anton Di Pasquale. So he should be able now to move forward. It'll be interesting to see what Reynolds does in comparison to Randall and how they play that down there at Penrod Racing. Be ready for it. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. What is interesting is that there was a lot of chatter about the possibility of tyre degradation earlier on today, and I actually saw some hurt tyres out there at the moment. None of that's going on. None. So the taper line is very, very flat, so the tyres are performing pretty strongly all the way to the end of their current, but relatively short stints, and they're performing almost as strongly as they did at the very beginning. Why don't we just put a little asterisk on that, Bart, because we only really analysed Reynolds, and the Reynolds numbers were extraordinary, because you were rolling out what lap time he was doing at the back end of his run. So his degradation has been really good. But when you've got a good car, that's what normally happens, isn't it? So again, through the course of the race, We'll just see what happens. It should get better. There should be more rubber down, cooler conditions later in the afternoon. That degradation probably should stay pretty good. But the last lap for Waters was a 20.9. His best lap's a 20.79. So he's in the similar boat. Yeah. Buddy's yeah. trade power pass here. And uh, power pass it was indeed because Hazelwood launched. <laughs> Golding was sort of half doing the same. <laughs> Todd's dragged all the gravel out with him and he's got the tiger by the tail. The thing's swinging all over the road. And he tried as hard as he dared to keep him behind him, but in the end he had to surrender. Not willingly, by the way. No. So this is at turn seven, and eventually claims the position. There's a nice move here, up at turn seven, to be able to do that by James Golding. And uh, got down the inside. Uh, Hazelwood was doing everything he could, and particularly the way he launched over the one-two chicane. That all looked a bit tidier this time. <laughs> Tight temperature will do that. <laughs> yes, funny how that works. So there are six cars in the field at the moment that have not yet stopped. Reynolds, Waters, Heimgartner, LeBrock, Jones, Fraser. They you, still take their CPS. And your point about Waters, he's he's just done now. He's 
fastest cumulative time at this point of the race. Yeah, so, so Waters has got negative deck. Yeah. So his tyres are actually going the other way, which is a rarity. They're getting better as they get older. Everybody wants that trick. Yeah, you're not wrong. Look at this. Side-by-side -side action, Deep Pasquale and Kostecki on the run down towards Turn 1. This is no man's land up on the outside. Replay from the other angle. I don't want to be in the Coke Camaro on the outside now, do you? No. No. I, oh, is it, did he get away with it down here? I think Anton's let him get away with it. Right. Oh! <laughs> wow. Talk about risk management. And Feeney here having a plunge down the inside. Heimgartner and Fraser, meantime, have come into the pit lane. And Brock gets that one nicely done on Anton. Uh, drags James Courtney with him in the process. So there's a big hustle going on here at the moment between Reynolds and Waters, remembering that they were the two drivers that were victorious on the streets of the Gold Coast a few weeks ago. Because Cam's numbers at the moment are very good. In the first sector, he was two tenths quicker than Reynolds. In the second sector, then, he was a tenth faster. So he's got some real speed generating here at the moment. And our leader is now in. David Reynolds has negotiated cleanly into the pit lane. Four tyres, pretty short stuff, about 12 seconds in total. Going on, all tyres are done, just waiting on fuel. Good communication there with the team. David Reynolds, he's obviously trying there to understand track position wise where Thomas Randall is going to be. And he's pretty quickly found him. He pretty quickly looks in the mirror and there's the Castrol Mustang of Thomas Randall. So what is going to be interesting is what do they do with Cam Waters? Do they slightly underfill Cam Waters and put him out in front of Reynolds, given that they were pretty close on track before the stop? And here's, here's Thomas. Oh, gee, he almost got down there. He was about to have a lunge down the inside of turn seven probably would have meant that the cars would have made contact. Now we saw both of them very fast through turn eight. Now David's not really up to temperature yet, but he got through there well and he blocks him. So Waters is in. Now this will be really interesting because this is the battle for the lead. Yeah, the rejoin. Yep. So they'll invariably fuel Cam to a point where they can sneak him out just in front. But a big moment there for Randall to be able to try and make a move. And David's well aware. Go, 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 go. Go, go, go. Yeah, so they've determined just the right amount of fuel here to have him pop out the other side in control. Only just. No. No. Oh. <laughs> Almost wiped their own car out with it. So not the case, in fact. I thought that might have been enough for them to pop out in front. So what, too. How much did they put on Cam Waters' car then, fuel-wise? It's now 43, remember? That's what's tripping us up. Yeah. So 26, 26 litres. litres. Enough, yeah. yeah. And they're all basically the same. So Reynolds, 26 litres. Waters, 26 litres. Kostecki, 26 litres. after the first round of stops. Reynolds in control just by three quarters of a second from Randall, who's got a quick car. He's demonstrated that on multiple this weekend, multiple occasions. And then we've got Waters, who's just taken that stop. And um, comparison-wise, they, they basically put the same amount of fuel in for Waters that went into Reynolds. And Randall's the one that's slightly different in his fueling. So he only took on 21. But I'm surprised that the Tickford didn't uh, slightly short fuel Cam to keep him in the, in the lead position. 
And as it's and turned out... Have, I beg your pardon, sorry. Oh, as it's turned out, the gap that Reynolds has got to Waters was pretty much the gap they had before the stop, wasn't it? And bad sportsmanship flag here being shown, cars 2 and 20. That's Percat and Pi, and they've been a bit too aggressive over the top of the turn 2 curbing. So it's nice and tight up the front, isn't it? And uh, Brody's sitting nicely there in fourth position at the moment. Got him a 99. He also took on about the same amount of fuel as the fellows that we were just discussing in rounded terms, about 26 litres. You can see him just sitting nicely in the background there. And he doesn't have much of a margin over Will Davis. And there are plenty of people in contention here. Sunday winner from last year, Brock Feeney's next in sixth position, and then Courtney De Pasquale, Heimgartner, and Mostert. So, to your point, there's a lot of cars genuinely on our corrected orders around fuel and all the things. There's there's seven, oh sorry, there's nine cars that are within 10 seconds. So there's a bucket load of people that have played their card and have got good race pace in comparison to where they qualified. Yeah, now that car of Mostert that you just saw on screen and his car two down the inside as well, Nick Percat. Mostert and Adam DeBore is having his last run this weekend with Walkinshire under the United. They did put a bit more fuel on that car, about an extra 14 litres over and above those lead cars. That might serve him well a bit later because he is in a reasonable track position at the moment. He's only 15 seconds off the lead of the race. Hazelwood on the inside of De Pasquale. So that early stop for De Pasquale is now hurting him. Yeah, so uh, he came in on lap 16. So that, that's a, an interesting little telltale on those tyres. Yeah, where are we now? On lap 33. Because remember, he went out and went so fast. He's done the fastest lap of the race. So we'll give you those numbers in a second too because the 20.4 was the number that he did to be the quickest. But he's going backwards at the moment in terms of relative pace around him. Forty-six laps remain. David Reynolds is our leader at 0.8 of a second is the margin to Thomas Randall. Cam Waters in position number three. Randall's the one that needs a bit more fuel when they next stop. Matt Payne, who's out of sequence because they got some damage in the opening lap, is back in the pit lane ring. Yeah, Crumpo, I've actually just touched base with Shell V Power Racing in regards to Anton Deep as well. Like, it's not actually that early a stop. He's nursing some pretty significant steering damage from that earlier contact with Will Brown, so that car is not nice at the moment. Uh, well, we did theorise about that early, but in the, in the, at the commencement of the stint, he was hanging on OK, but maybe it's deteriorated as time's gone by because he's got no firepower out there at the moment. And Cam Waters has just done the fastest lap of the race with a 20.28. So, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because even in the first phase, when Deep Pasquale did the fastest lap of the race, we were sort of going, oh, well, it mustn't have any damage, but there wouldn't be a shock given the wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact that he had with Will Brown early that that steering damage is significant enough to actually hurt the performance. So Anton Di Pasquale now up there at turn eight. And when you've got a car that's got weird steering and things don't feel that great, in fact, you can see it tracking. Maybe the bodywork is also an issue there because when that car was under brakes then, it was crabbing down the road. No doubt, in the braking area there, it was not linear. As we got that front shot, yeah, for sure, there's, there's something going on with the rear toe on car 11. So when the car, look at that. So that, that car is not, so you can do that with the line and you can see that the right hand rear of the car is tracking to the right away from the front of the car. And this will be as a result of what happened in the opening lap of the race in the contact with Will Brown, no doubt. And there's actually a fair old scuff down the left rear corner of that car. And yeah, it's crabbing down the road, all right. Heimgartner gets down the inside. Mostert's just moved up one spot on Heimgartner, by the way, as we look at this replay. So Chaz is now up into position number eight. Now, I wonder whether that's deteriorated as time's gone by, because we, we actually commented on the fact that we thought it may have been possible for Anton to have had some damage, and we were remarking on the fact that it wasn't showing any signs of that early, because it was actually doing reasonable pace, but it's not now. And there's the pass that I just mentioned a moment ago. Gets Chaz up one spot now, and he's in 
behind James Courtney, who's sitting in seventh. The fastest lap of the race, Waters, 120.2. 1.1 second margin covers first to third. So this is a lively little encounter brewing up here at the moment. Kostecki's just off the podium in fourth at the moment. Ooh, it's golding in the fence there at turn eight. And that's hit hard enough with a left-hand rear. You can see Percat with no margin and the car in behind it. What actually often happens is when the car in front is close to hitting the fence, often you'll, you'll see the car behind does make contact because your trajectory is always just a little bit off what the car in front does. If you look carefully in the replay there, you'll see something that I spoke about in the Hino Hub. It's very dirty off the line now, so there's a lot of marbles here. So you run wide like that, bang. Now last year, James didn't finish Saturday because he hit the wall at turn eight. Yeah. So it's grabbed him again. And that'll be the area where the, there's the greatest amount of risk because the cars have got a lot of energy in them around there. You're really leaning on the tyre. It's high speed, so there'll be more of that to contend with as the afternoon goes on. We've still got 43 laps of racing to come. And seemingly at the moment, he's got away with it. I don't know what they're going to do there with car 11 with Deep Squally. So on that, in the first sector, he's done a 29-1. The fastest in sector one has been Matt Payne with a 27-3. So it's 1.8 seconds too slow in the first sector. So um, at some point, you've got to put the white flag up probably and drag him in. This is the battle for the lead. So those three Mustangs are very, very impressive at the moment. The way they're flowing those Tickford cars, they look really good. And you can't take anything away from what David Reynolds has done so far this weekend. He and Matt Payne have been exceptionally fast. In fact, the margin that Brody Kostecki was able to grab pole by was just extraordinary. It looked for sure like David Reynolds was going to be on pole position. So their pace has been very strong and their race pace looks very similar. In fact, Cam Waters looks like he's actually slightly better off at the moment than what Thomas Randall is. And is Thomas? Yes, he is. A little directive there and Thomas just parks it wide and lets Cam go. Cam will now work hard to get to the back of the Penrite Mustang. Great images there of that overtaking manoeuvre from the Century Batteries chopper cam. So it's Waters v Reynolds now for the lead of the race. Kostecki is four seconds adrift of David Reynolds. They come into shot in the back there, so it's not completely out of the hunt and the race will change around the there he is right there so as they're coming off Wakefield Street then Brody Kostecki is coming on to Wakefield Street coming out of turn three so roughly 180 or 200 meters difference in the actual track distance between those cars and again, when the fuel loads change and the tyre wear and the performance later in the day when the circuit rubbers in, it's a big lock up there by Hazelwood, and that was clumsy. He was battling to get it stopped, and then he speared into the side of James Golding. Can't get it stopped. Golding turns in. And James wouldn't have known that at that point, here it is on board. So James has turned the wheel to turn the Newlong Camaro at the corner, and he wouldn't have known that, he would have known that Hazel was coming, but he wouldn't have known that Hazel wasn't able to pull it up as efficiently as he needed to, to be able to get by without contact. We've seen a lot of front locking there, haven't we, this weekend? Yeah, I think these cars with less downforce on them have been a bigger challenge to deal with in the approach down there. Fastest car on the last lap was Cam Waters. Half a second is the margin. We saw that great chopper shot before, showed you the margin across the top three, and Waters the one showing the pace at the moment. So he's now really on a mission here, and he's within striking distance of Reynolds. Now, if he gets a good run out of seven through eight, watch for him to try and have a lunge down there because he appears to be pretty strong under brakes into the hairpin down at nine. David's still got a reasonable margin there out of turn seven. So, Deepa Squally 
His fastest lap was a 20.4. He just did a 25.26. Almost five seconds slower than he did earlier. So we, we saw the issue with the car. I mean, I just don't know. Oh, that's At some point, you've got to drag the car in. That's crept in. That wasn't there no. in the immediate aftermath after the Will Brown contact. That wasn't there. So something's gone awry. Something's bent or failed. But he's eighth in the championship, so they'll probably be trying to do everything they can to get him to the next fuel window. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Getting up on these sides, you're awesome through turn eight, so we won't be able to get a run on you. He is awesome through turn eight. I was watching that from those shots there before. Alistair McVeigh in the background just coaching David Reynolds. There'll be a change in that relationship off the back of this weekend as well. With David being on the move, Tim Edwards keeping an eye on Cam Waters. Shortly to become the supercars general manager of motorsport. Now that incident down at turn 14, I thought that perhaps race control might want to have a look at it and they are going to. So uh, the dive bomb of Tate, Todd Hazelwood on James Golding will be investigated. He's giving him a thumb and gain from it. So that'll probably cop a, a whack as we jump on board here. Turn eight, he is awesome through turn eight, David Reynolds, but he needs to be because this car is very quick through the majority of the rest of the track. So quick that he can now offer up an opportunity for a pass down here at the hairpin. And how's that? From about 20 odd meters behind, he got to within a millimeter of the bumper bar down at turn nine. Yeah, brake performance is very strong, isn't it? Yeah, turn eight, I mean, he was very strong out the other side, Reynolds, and there was 20-odd metres. By the time they got down to the corner... Race control to all teams. Five-second time penalty to car three for a driving infringement. Yeah, James Taylor in race control for Motorsport Australia. So no surprise there that Todd Hazelwood gets a little slap on the wrist for that one. Driving standards advisor Craig Baird would have looked at it, had a good look at the data, and determined that he made a gain from a bump. Back on here with Waters who moves it to the left and then was sort of potentially half jinking it to the right. He's sweating on him now. So this is awkward for Reynolds because the fastest way around the racetrack is to stay on the racing line. If he comes off the racing line to defend, he makes himself more vulnerable, but he's going to have to if he's going to survive here, but no. And in the end, Waters just grinds on by. So he's just pressed on, and that's brought Randall in. Thomas is in here now as well. Waters covers down the inside as they all rush to turn eight. That is first, second and third with 38 laps remaining. Second last race of the championship year. And here comes Randall. Thinking about it, high and low. Reynolds tries to respond out the other side of turn nine. First, second, third, back to second gear for the left-hander at 11. Great racing when you've got 0.4 of a second across the top three cars. Very aggressive move there by Cam Waters. Don't often see a move on the way into turn seven. There's a big wall on the left-hand side on the exit of seven. If it all goes wrong, you very easily make contact there. So this is the run of six down to seven, down the inside. There would have been a little bit of contact for sure, but he was able to get it done in the end. And what it did is it took Dave Reynolds out of play then didn't have to do a big bold move through the fast turn eight. Here we are, we're on board. Dave sort of turns in, yeah, you can see the two mirrors there whacked. That's <laughs> high stress for Trudy Edwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They feel every millimetre of this in the garages. They're smiling, that's, Tim. That's impassive, Tim. Yeah, it is. It's a new character. Yeah. Battle for first, second and third. Tiny margin in favour of Waters now. There's a hustle on here for Randall. He's looking high and low to see whether or not he can get something going on David Reynolds. Remembering that the first two here did so well on the streets of surfers only a few weeks ago. So they've carried the form forward. And Kostecki now is five and a half seconds off the lead, but he's not that far away from this group either. So any misadventures between this slot and there he is, and he'll be right with them. <laughs> That's what he's done. He's parked there. I want to stay out of all that racing action. I want to be in front of that car behind, but I don't want to be too close to those lunatics at the front. 
So, guys, let's see if we can get that answer to the question we've been asking. A bloke I've been really keen to chat to tells me he might be out of retirement. Love to see more of you. Ryan Story, great to see you back here, mate. Just quickly, you've obviously made an assessment. The time that Anton's losing is not worthy of bringing him in and making the change. What's, what's going on there? So there's obviously damage from that opening lap incident. And now it's all about safety as the priority. And uh, if we can pick up a handful of points, we'll obviously take that. But uh, if there's a safety car, we'll see what we can do. But the guys have assessed it, and it's not worth pulling it in as it is now. Perfect. Thank you, and great to see you back in here, pal. Thanks, Larko. Cheers, mate. It's interesting emotions here in the Erebus Motorsport Garage. I just caught up with George Commons, who's the engineer for Brody Kostecki, and I just asked him, how's the race going? He said they don't have the pace for those three Fords in front of them, so they're running their own race. I then asked him, did you tell Brody that Shane was out of the race? He said, of course we did, but he knows he's still got to get the car to the finish line. So they're running their own race, but the other side of the garage is where the emotion comes into it. You can see the crew starting to think about the possible repairs to Will Brown's car, how late at night that will be and how many spare parts they'll need to be. So. Certainly mixed emotions down here. David Reynolds, intercepted a radio message from David Reynolds back to the team here at the Penrite Racing Garage that he's starting to have some steering dramas. All he said is, I've got some steering issues going on. So the team have told him to, best, to bat on as best he can and stay as close as he can to Cam Waters because they feel like they've got a shorter pit stop time at the final pit stop than the number 43 Monster Energy Mustang. So Reynolds battling a few issues, but they feel if they can stay close to Cam Waters, they're still in the game. Tim Edwards, yourself and your wife have been in this business for a very long time, but the emotion and the stress doesn't go away, does it? No, nah, it doesn't, but look, I'm loving this. I'm enjoying it, you know. To have two of our cars up the front after the difficult year we've had, you know. Um, hopefully, you know, there's still 35 laps to go, so I'm not counting my chickens yet, but it would be nice to have our last round with another podium. We'll see what happens. Good luck, Tim. Waters has got a 1.3 second margin to keep Tim in a relaxed state at the moment over David Reynolds and Thomas Randall next. <laughs> to keep Tim in a relaxed state. <laughs> well, well, it's a handy margin because it's been pretty tight in the last few laps across that group of cars, so that'll help his stress levels. And it's a 7.4 seconds now, Brody away from the lead. So he's just starting to drift off that group. It was only five and a half seconds when I remarked yeah. a lap or two back. So he's lost a little bit of ground there. In fact, if anything, he could be vulnerable because Will Davison's right on him now. All going on back here. Hercat, Hazelwood, Pye. And there's a five second penalty hanging over Todd at the moment for that little barge pass down there at the final turn. And Mark Winterbottom's just sitting in behind in 13. This is for the Adelaide Cup. It's <laughs> Hazelwood, Pye, Mercat, all from Adelaide. Where's Slady? Can find Slady. Slady's just down a little bit from there. But... So the South Australian Cup is being heavily contested from position 10. Mark Winterbottom, nice move up the inside. Cam Waters, fastest car on the track last lap from David Reynolds. So at the moment, Waters and Reynolds pressing on pretty hard. Randall was the fourth fastest car. Matt Payne, right down the bottom of the order based on the early damage, he was the third fastest car. So those Penrite Mustangs again showing good pace. This is, I, I thought I saw him hit the fence here. Yeah, it just bumped that right rear on the fence there again. That won't help the wheel alignment either. Oh, maybe, did he miss it? I, I think he did just barely, but it's got a touch of the shopping trolleys about it at the moment, hasn't it? It's steering from both ends. Yeah, ugly scenario there. And there's the gap. A little bit of a gap, it's just moved out now to one and three quarter seconds. Golding in. It's been a pretty clear. eventful day. Four that big move that Hazelwood put on him at turn 14, and his own mistake at turn eight, where he made pretty sizable.
contact with the fence on the left-hand side. You can just see him there, just making sure that the wheels are on there, hooked up properly. Just gave the steering a reef both ways, just to understand that the wheels are actually located properly on the car, and it doesn't feel like anything's weird. We're starting to range up to the second stop window now. Second compulsory stop. The teams and drivers need to affect. And if you look at those numbers at the moment, a little bit more fuel's got to go into Thomas Randall's car. But the guy that's actually going to be stationary for the least amount of time in the top half dozen cars is Chaz Mostert. As far as the leaders are concerned, it's pretty much the same deal across borders and Reynolds. For what they've got to do is Courtney now takes his second stop. That's 15 seconds down, Cordo. His last weekend with Tickford, James Courtney. 2.2 seconds the gap now waters over Reynolds and a 1.3 second margin Reynolds over Randall and a bit of pressure on at the moment for Brody Gostecki who was safely rolling along in fourth We've got Will Davison right with him at the moment who's having a pretty decent run this afternoon he is he's up seven spots so Will Davison when you look down that totem there's been some really good performances. Heimgartner's up nine. Winterbottom and Pye both up ten positions. Macaulay Jones and the Pizza Hut Camaro, nice job in a couple of... Yeah. They're looking to try and undercut with car 17, undercut Brody here, so they brought, brought Will in. Yes. So he was right on the rear bumper That's of right. Brody as he yep. came in. Yep. And Brock Feeney follows him in. And they've been hooked together with a tow rope all day, haven't they, yeah. Davison and Feeney? Yeah, they, they may get a gain here depending on what they do at Erebus. So we're going to make a change here, we're going to make a sway bar change. We're either going to, so on those knives on the end, we'll probably get Larko to have a little look at this for us. But they're actually doing both sides, so they're changing the knives on the ends of the anti roll bars there. So either stiffen or soften the anti-roll bar lift hand wheel on and the fuel has been completed so that's all done and that change made to the front they're able to do a little swap over at the same time yeah, so Feeney now in front of car number 17 and they had to, it's that second stop where you've got to take the bigger drink it seems like a very long time when you're waiting there Last of your BP fuel on, Courtney in the background. Randall's now come in here as well, there he is. Peeling out a third position. <laughs> Meantime, Mark Winterbottom's got the bad sportsmanship flag for using a bit too much of the track. Doesn't look like there's any mechanical changes in terms of balance being done to the Castrol Mustang for Thomas Randall. Well, that car's been pretty quick. Well balanced. Only a few more seconds here, mate, to get the pit. Feels like an eternity. <laughs> 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 okay, so that's him fueled to the finish now. Compulsory stops completed for Thomas Randall. 30 laps remain. Nothing in the way of high tyre stress that was being talked about pre-race. And uh, these tyres have hung on very well here this afternoon. Nor has there been any sign of any rain, uh, despite the fact that the forecast has had showers on it pretty much the whole day. Price forward just sitting in behind Thomas Randall. It does look like that wind from the southwest is stronger than it was by a fair bit top yeah, of the grandstand. Got down to about 5Ks when we were doing the shootout earlier today and then at the start of the race here it was about 25. It looks like, as you say, it's freshened up even a bit more now. Cool shot looking down the sill panel of Thomas's car and you can see how much stress goes into that tyre. So they've reacted with Brody to the fact that the two marauders behind weren't too far. And with a fresh tyre they could, could grab him, but I don't think there's too much stress in there strategy play at the moment. They just want to get him to the end, and then he's the champ elect. 
So what Neil means by the champ elect is that he's got the end of this race, the objective for the team is to have more than a 150 point lead over Shane Van Gisbergen with wherever he finishes in the first leg of the Velo Adelaide 500. That means that he will overnight assume effectively the provisional winner of the championship until tomorrow on the last race is run, excluding any penalties or anything that may transpire out of tomorrow's event. That was a pretty straightforward stop. And uh, Brock and Smith, I think Pi was in there as well in that sequence. We were focused on this fellow. So Waters now 2.7 seconds over David Reynolds and uh, Chas Mostert now moving up into third. Um, he did Peter. come out in front, sorry Neil, he did come out in front of uh, Brock Feeney and Will Davison there, Brody. And it's no cruise fest for him either. You know, he, whilst he's not in, engaging in any real hand-to-hand -hand combat, you've got to be careful when you feed back out into the pack who you're racing, whether anyone makes any kind of a move. You've got to have that situational awareness, awareness well and truly alive and up. The antenna needs to be up to deal with all of those things as Waters uh, gets compromised a little bit trying to get through turn one. And uh, Pi was trying to hang on there. Had to surf over the top of the curbing to try and stay out of his way. Gee, that was his, close, wasn't it? Yeah, his huh? view from Scott's car. So he's released from the 40k speed limit and then uh, very limited peripheral vision with these cars. And then he had to come out of the throttle and let water sneak on by. Who then went back onto the racing line. That was close. Easy there to make well, contact on the way up. That's exactly what I was just in the middle of describing about how suddenly unforeseen things can change the destiny of one of these races very rapidly. When you think about what actually happened with Anton Di Pasquale and Will Brown right at the start, I mean, that's the best example, isn't it? I think the other thing that you've always got to consider in races like this, where it's not as intense for Brody Kostecki in terms of the absolute outright battle he was having with Van Gisbergen, is you can't be too complacent either. You can't be in too much of cruise mode because that doesn't serve you well in terms of mistakes. So when do they decide to bring Waters and Reynolds in? Mostert up to third, and I said before that Mostert's got of that lead group of cars, he's got a little less fuel to be able to stick in. For those that may have only just joined the telecast, it's a different number this weekend for Cam Waters, car number 43, that's celebrating and a tribute to the late, great Ken Block, who sadly lost his life earlier this year. As Cam now reacts and comes into the lane for his final stop of the and uh, Block performed here back in 2013. Cool stuff with the Ford Fiesta. And so Monster dedicated delivery of the car this weekend in tribute. And running the famous number. Got about 15 seconds down, quarters, so 15 to go. 20 seconds down, 10 seconds to go now. Pretty clear when we drop, no one behind. Five forward here, mate, when we drop right. Almost there. Still clear, still clear. Get ready now. Go, go, go. Go get him, go get him, mate. Go get him. Matty Roberts. <laughs> go get him, mate. Go get him. He, uh, he's got the eyes on regardless. He's got plenty of incentive. That was his teammate coming out of the final corner in the background, Thomas Randall. Remember that uh, Thomas needed uh, a little more fuel, so that's why that margin's opened up. If you're wondering why their relativity's changed compared to when you last saw them together on the track, they short filled Thomas just five or six litres. Less went into that car in the first stop than Cam. So uh, in the second stop, you pay the price. So Reynolds is now 18.8 seconds up on Chaz Mostert. 
and now they'll ultimately react with him as well. Certainly not done yet, but it looks as though this guy's got a pretty speedy car out there at the moment, Cam Waters. It does, but, but conversely, Reynolds has just done the fastest second sector, the middle sector, because he's got to press on now to make up that roughly one second difference that he had in terms of fuel. So he's got to now put some really good laps together to be able to get out in front of Cam Waters to contest the last stage of this race. I'm Gartner and Percat now into the pit lane as well. So Reynolds did that fastest middle sector on that last lap to underscore the point that you're making. So he is pushing very hard at the moment. He'll have been given the word by Al to try and get a hustle on, protect himself. Watching carefully to see what they do with David Reynolds here. He's squeezing very, very hard at the moment because on correction, if he's got some decent lap speed here, he's got about the same amount of fuel to put on that Cam Waters did as they now bring him in. So we are expecting to see a pretty lively battle out the other side of this pit stop between he and Cam Waters, who's got a very quick car this afternoon. Prediction is roughly a second between them. New tyres there for David. 30 seconds. Do they make any mechanical sorry. tweaks? No, they don't. So that's a good uh, sign. If there's no balance change or tweak required, so he's obviously happy with it. Uh, Report it back. We're doing a tear off. Just Sorry, done the tear I'm off. On board now on the left of the screen. Just doing some uh, Cam Waters. And that trundle down the lane at 40 k's right now feels painful. Yeah, especially no. when you know there's a car coming by you. And there's an opponent on his way. And he comes out in front, but is he going to stay there? Oh, and how close, side by side through turn one, and they both come out the other side and only just wriggle out there without ending up in a complete mess. That Unbelievably tight moment. Brilliant driving by both of them. Absolutely brilliant. Fantastic performance by both those boys to manage to unlock that knot oh, because that could have turned into a gigantic mess all over the road. Well, how both of those cars are massively damaged as a consequence of how close that was. This is now on board with David Reynolds. Here comes Cam. David turns it in. He has to take evasive action across the inside curb. And right there at the point between turn two and turn three, those two cars were so close to making contact right now. Oh. <laughs> oh, dear. So Waters absolutely had the crosshairs on. So he was going through there absolutely no matter what. David's doing everything he can to hustle, but he's got cold tyres. He's got no grip. He had to shortcut over the top and wriggle out the other side, and they managed to tell the tale, both of them. Mossed it in. <laughs> managed to tell the story. They did. They get out the other side. Now, McCauley Jones and Matt Payne have been given the bad sportsmanship flag as well. Yeah, because in other circumstances, so for example, Reynolds trips awkwardly on the kerb, gets more sideways. He could flick into waters easily. Or Cam, because he was so committed, can't just shift the car around at will because it's grip limited in that spot. So uh, they were both able to slice out the other side is probably the right way to describe it. Well, it's right. Side by side. Oh, here we go here. again. Oh, that was close with Feeney on the outside there of Chaz. Chaz gave Brock enough racing room there to avoid any problems with the left-hand side. And that was shades of what happened on the opening lap involving Duke Pasquale and Brown. So and, Feeney hanging on there. And probably the thing about the rejoin with David and Cam that's probably most important is that David didn't just turn straight down to the apex. Because if he did, as committed as Cam was, they were going to run into each other. There was going to be contact, wasn't there? Davison having a look on forward, and he's successfully achieved that pass at turn nine at the hairpin. So things have settled down up the front with a one and a bit margin, one and a bit second margin waters over Reynolds. And then uh, that little shift in the fuel has just put Randall further behind. Here's the replay up here at turn four. 
So this was a little bit hold your breath for a tick here as well. And then uh, Chaz has given him space off the other side. But then because he's on the outside for the next left-hander, Mostert's not in the ideal position there to be able to continue to close that deal. Drops in behind him. A few people out there on personal best laps as well. So Jack LeBrock and Todd Hazelwood, even uh, Declan Fraser out there at the moment showing some pretty decent speed. Scafie, you asked about that uh, front anti roll bar adjustment. Now, that's one of the premium tuning tools we see on the pit lane now. You see Brock Feeney getting a little bit of benefit, chasing the track, we call it. So let's dive into the front underneath his car, and you talked about this blade. Here it is here, and you can rotate it. You can undo this nut here and rotate it. So that's exactly what they do. Now, that's connected by a big tube to another one on the other side. And again, I've said it before, you imagine if they're up this way, they're really, really stiff, and they twist the bar in the middle. If they do go this way, they flap around like this. So as the track grip comes up, you might want the car softer at the front so you can make it point and use the rear tyre. Might be the other way. Maybe you had some understeer and you didn't like that. So great tuning device. They've got exactly the same thing at the back of the car. But remember, we used to be able to do this from the cockpit last year. Now it's a pit stop tuning tool. And yeah, that's certainly been a bit of a game changer, hasn't it? Not being able to do that on the run now. And you can see... It's quite a mission for crew to get under the car. They've got to put the incompressible jacks in there, the stubbies, to make sure that the jack stands protect the crews while they're working beneath the car. Meantime, this battle's lively here between Feeney and Most at fifth and sixth. Chas was having a good look around the back of the Red Bull car when Mark was explaining to us what those anti-roll bars do and the adjustable blades. So most has got the incentive on here at the moment with good fresh tyres on that car. Things have livened up for this little battle between these guys. And it looks like he's carrying a bit more speed if he can figure out just the right place to apply it. Meantime, the margin first to seconds just crushed a little bit on this last lap too now. It's just come down to 1.1 seconds. What's Mostert look like through the fast right-hander here at eight? And he's got a decent run. He's going to have a nudge. And he offers the nose up on the inside. Brock runs with him to try and make it two by two through the corner. But it's a diminishing return when you're on the outside there. And Chaz is able to make good that pass. Brings him up into position number five. And that pace, that gap that you just spoke of, that's because David Reynolds has just done his personal best of the day, 20.2. So 20.15 was the fastest lap of the race by Cam Waters on lap 38. But on lap 58, so the last lap, that was the fastest that we've seen from David Reynolds. And he's now just under one second behind Cam Waters. So that battle for the lead is not over. I'm Gartner and Courtney have got some good combat going here too in eighth and ninth position. Andre has a sniff up the inside. around the fringes of the racing line and you'll see all that rubber debris that I spoke about earlier, particularly evident in the medium high speed corners. Lots of it on the exit there of turn seven. There's a pile of it down here at turn eight. Gee, the boys are going hard at the front at the moment. Yeah, so water's responding. He's gone quicker in sector one. Look at the amount of oh, build up on the outside yeah. there, it's huge. So Cam's gone faster in sector one and Reynolds has gone faster in the mid sector. 20.1 is the fastest lap of the race and it's owned by Waters. And a 20.2, David Reynolds, he did that last time around. In fact, he's just got into the 19s. So Davey's got a big push on here at the moment. 19.9 for the new fastest lap of the race. So they are hustling and that margin's officially half a second. We don't need the stopwatch on it now though. You can see how lively this one looks. So these two are squeezing qualifying laps. And we didn't see a balance change or a ride height or a sway bar or anything done on either of those last stops. So for whatever reason, as this track has gripped up, it looks like it's really suiting the setup of car 26. David Reynolds and the Penrite Mustang, that's a strong time. You think they were doing 19s in qualifying. So a 19.95 is a very, very impressive time at this part of the race. It's very strong. And there's been nothing even close to the amount of tyre degradation that was being talked about as a possibility because there was the fear that because some people had only done runs of 
a dozen, maybe 15 laps, and some of them, a couple of them got into the high teens, that it just wasn't enough tyre knowledge to be able to say with confidence that you could get through to the end of a fuel stint without hurting the tyre. But uh, we're not seeing any of that tyre hurt at all. Almost the opposite. So as the places rub it in, because the temperature's still the same out there at the moment, it's still 19 degrees. Point two last lap for Cam Waters, 20.17 for David Reynolds, so there's really nothing in that. And uh, 20.8 for Thomas Randall. Brady Gostecki has got it crossed up on the run into turn one, sliding it in on the rear brake. And uh, that would have triggered, or you would think, be half a chance to be triggering. So what happens is they get a little bit of uh, credit in the bank and they draw down on it, so it's probably the right end of the race to use it before, but if you use too much, you get the bad sportsmanship flag. Now, if you scrape all that together, you could probably get a brand new Dunlop soft tyre out of it, because there's a fair bit of it building up on the outside of turn eight. Needless to say, you need to be very committed to staying on the racing line through there, Gar. Just an update on where the speed for Dave Reynolds has come from after this last pit stop. It was brand new tyres down the working side of the left side of the race car and a very lightly roaded set of tyres down the right side. And we have not heard again anything about the steering issues for Dave Reynolds. So performance coming back to the number 26 Penrite Mustang. Yeah, that's a good update because when we saw those fresh tyres, I didn't know whether they put four on or two. So thanks, Garth, for clarifying what they actually did there. And probably at this point of the race, when you've only got a lightly rotor tyre on the right-hand side of the car, you wouldn't have too much drama with braking stability and all the things that normally grab you when you've got a rotor tyre on one side and a new tyre on the other. So he's been able to put that to really good effect. And a 1995, it's faster than I thought they would go in the race, especially with that fuel load on, with just under 20 laps remaining. His young teammate, Matt Payne, young teammate of David Reynolds could well knock off that faster slap because he could be on target here for an even better number. He's gone quick in sector one. He's all but matched Reynolds in sector two. Current trend projecting that he might even be in front. So there's no doubt about the pace in the Penrite cars and they've just re-signed with Grove Racing, extended that partnership in a multi-year agreement. It's such a shame that Matt Payne's not out there in amongst this after copping damage on that opening lap because the youngster's got certainly some pep in his step at the moment, beneficiary of a recent test that was a bit weather compromised at Winton as well. Coming up now, it'll be 16 laps remaining when the cars cross the control line this time through. And that last lap of pain uh, ended up being just, it was it, it, in the very low 20s. He didn't quite get into the 19s, wasn't quite there in the final sector. And Cam Waters has responded because, again, that lap on the last lap was 65 ten thousandths of a second away from his fastest lap of the race so far. Fastest car on the racetrack at the moment is Cam Waters on that last lap. The second quickest car was Matt Payne. He's nearly four laps off the lead after the damage sustained in the opening lap of the race and then Reynolds was the third fastest car but David's still only 0.8 of a second away on the computer timing. There's position number three, Thomas Randall. Go back and look for Brody Gostecki who's got one hand on the championship trophy now this afternoon. There he is in fourth position and commented earlier about the amount of rubber building up on the outside of the road there. Now he's a little bit vulnerable to a very quick Chas Mostert at the moment. Feeney then Davison, then Courtney, then Heimgartner, then Pye here in the red car, his teammate Winterbottom, then Golding, Hazelwood, the Red Arc livery on the car this weekend, LeBrock, then Declan Fraser in the tradie entry, and Macaulay Jones. Tim Slater's in 17th position, Nick Perkett's here in 18th position. There's Matt Payne, who's out of sequence. 3.9 laps off the lead. Then it's Deepa Squally in 21st, who's limping around. And uh, the car's crabbing its way around the circuit at the moment. They decided that from a safety standpoint, it was OK, but just had no performance. Something's worsened through the race. The car was involved in 
copying some damage in the opening lap on turn four, tangled with Will Brown, and then things got worse for whatever reason later in the race, and there we are back at our lead again. So that gives you an idea of where all the various drivers are parked in the field. Now, here we go again. Waters, on this lap, has gone personal best in sectors one and two, and his best lap so far is a 20.1. So they are effectively just rolling out quali lap after quali lap. They are in full push mode here at the moment. 1.2 seconds, the gap first to second. The fastest car on the last lap was Matt Payne. 20.07, so Waters is just tantalisingly close to be able to crack a 19 there at the moment. And for Davey, it was a 20.4. Just lost a little bit of margin on that lap. And the thing is, when you're surfing right up on that edge with nothing left, the tiniest little slip, little pinch of the brake here or there, or just miss an apex or excite the rear tyre, just that little bit too much coming off the corner, just enough for you to lose a bit on that elastic band when you're trying to hang on to whoever's in front of you. So it's a real mental challenge to be able to stay neatly in that box to drive with absolute precision, not making any mistakes at all when you're in such combat like Waters and Reynolds are at the moment. Board now with Hazelwood showing those forces and so significant through the streets of Adelaide, see the bumps, curbs, left, left rear working very hard, above the Dunlop signage, the Pettis Super Shop, and the amount of work that the loaded side rear does at this location is massive. And have a look at this when we get to turn eight. So pay particular attention to the tire loading. See the inside crown of the tire working so hard. Sidewall bag loaded massively. You can see the distortion of the bag of the tire there. And then it gets a holiday through this little left kink. And then it leaps up and above. That's a little bit of airborne action there over the inside curb. And then watch again through here. Peak loads as the car attacks turn 13 up and over the inside curb and then down to the second slowest corner on the track, turn 14. So the two slowest corners at the end of the back straight, turn nine and turn 14, basically the same sort of speed. Turn nine, just under 60K and turn 14, just over 60 kilometers an hour. But you arrive there at 200K through turn 13. Here's Mostert and Kostecki and Mostert down the inside. Brody doesn't fight. Brody knows that at this point, all he's looking to do is grab those points and end up with a margin greater than 150 points to Shane Van Gisbergen, who was unfortunately out on the opening lap of this race. Chaz just acknowledges the space that he's given out the other side there. And this is another carbon copy of the back end of races that we've seen with Chaz through the year where this thing's been strong in the closing stages and uh, you can see the graphic confirming 12 laps to go. So he's got good pace there at the moment, moving him up into fourth, but he's 20 seconds from the lead and 10 seconds behind Thomas Randall. So hard to imagine there'd be any further change. Mustangs one to four at the moment. Waters, Reynolds, Randall and Mostert. And uh, Brody just coasting nicely in fifth position at the moment, followed by Brock Feeney, Will Davison, James Courtney, Andre Heimgartner and Scott Pye. So the tension has not yet left the Erebus garage because no. it ain't over till it's over. But th they would have been as bewildered as we were at the beginning when all of a sudden they look up and not only is one of their team cars involved in some strife with Will Brown, but the car that they were battling in the championship was there limping up to turn five with damage and put him out. That was a shot, by the way, of Richard Childress, highly successful NASCAR team owner who's a big supporter of Brody Kostecki. And in fact, Brody's going to be in the US next week driving for him. And Richard's planning some outings for Brody in 2024. Going to put him on a couple of the well-known road courses over there at Watkins Glen and Sonoma in California. Watkins Glen on the other side of the country, one of the beautiful old grand racetracks of the world. And uh, that's a great opportunity for a young guy to have somebody of his caliber in your pit bunker 
and uh, as an admirer, came down from the US to support him this weekend. And we're building here to a pretty special moment in this fella's career. Certainly is great to have him here. He was very complimentary of the event and the cars, and he actually had a ride around with Brody Kostecki as a passenger earlier in the weekend. And he said he's had a, a lot of those opportunities through the course of his life. He hasn't been back in the car for a little while, but it was quite weird to jump in the passenger seat with Brody and go around this concrete canyon at Adelaide. The other part of the story today and we haven't really spoken about it at all, it was the battle for third position in the championship, which coming into today, Brock Feeney and Will Brown were separated by nine points. The Will Brown drama on the opening lap has allowed Brock Feeney now to move up into third position in the championship, and roughly 60 points adrift is Will Brown. So almost 70 point turnaround with the drama for Will earlier. Feeney here in sixth position at the moment. He's got a watching brief going. You can see Brody and Chaz just up the road. They're not terribly far away, and he'll be getting a reference as to whether or not he's gaining or losing on these guys. He's holding station pretty nicely at the moment. That's 2.1 seconds, that margin. You can see to the rear bumper of Brody just disappearing through turn one. 1.9 seconds gap waters Reynolds now. Nine seconds back to Randall, who's just drifted in this last stint. And then it's a 10 second gap back to Mostert. And a one second gap between Mostert just in the foreground together with Brody. And then here we are with Brock. That's a snapshot of the top six at the moment. 10 laps remain. And Brock was the second fastest car in the last lap. So he's pretty motivated to get to the back of Brody Kostecki. You can see that margin. He's driving the wheels off Red Bull Ampole Camaro right now. Remember that momentous win, his first career win on the streets of Adelaide here last year when he was able to, with that crazy surname Brock, dominate the event and to have a result that Holden fans were rejoicing over. Brock's now in a position where he's putting pressure on Brody Kostecki and they're battling for fifth and sixth. Now, who's the winner at the moment of the Adelaide Cup? Is Pi the lead South Australian? Yes. Yes. Now, he's in 10th. He was very fast here last year. He that was. car was yep. speedy. Well, not that car, but that entry. He's our race leader. He's got 2.1 seconds in hand at the moment, and he's winding them down. Cannot afford to relax too much, though, because Reynolds has kept him honest the whole way through this final stint there's just a tiny advantage and it is only a whisker in favour of Waters at the lap speed. Just enough. And for example, on that last lap, sector one, it's about three tenths in favour of Waters. And then a tenth of it was handed back the other way. Reynolds was a bit quicker in the mid sector. So the seesaw that is, it's kind of varying by on average about a tenth a lap, maybe a tenth and a half. It's just enough for this to squeak out as a margin. Yeah. And that's the stuff that you debrief at the end of the day then. You sit down, having spent, in David's case now, a good chunk of time looking at another car. And then together with his engineer, Alistair McVean, they'll just consider what tiny little changes they can make in order to change the behaviour of the vehicle in a couple of places to see whether they can do that without trading off in another area of the racetrack. And that trade-off is the hardest thing to manage in the setup process. One of the things that's been evident in the battle today is that Waters has had good braking authority into a couple of key spots that have given him a good run. Under brakes, for example, into the hairpin down at turn nine. And that's been one of Shane's great strengths in his championships and on street circuits has been the ability to be able to get into that brake pedal and maintain stability under brakes and under extreme braking pressure. There's also been some very good performances through the field on that totem that we've got on screen. So when you have a look, Courtney up eight, Heimgartner up eight, Pye and Winnipeg are both up ten positions. Declan Fraser up eight spots, Macaulay Jones up eight spots. So some commendable drives through the field. One point 
7.8 seconds. Last lap speed for Waters was a 20.7. It was a 20.6 for Reynolds. So Davy just pulled a little bit back on that occasion. Rounding up Anton Di Pasquale into turn four is Cam Waters. Anton's car steering from both ends at the moment. Yeah. No fun. That would be a shocking thing today, that. This car looks really stable. You can tell by Cam's hands and just turns in. No evidence of wheel spin out the other side. Has a bit of a breather now. There aren't too many of those on this racetrack. What they're doing there now is they're slightly changing their line at turn eight to make sure they make the apex. So they're braking a little bit more. They're leaving their foot on the brake as a sort of a trail brake to the apex and running the car slightly narrower than they would for their optimal line just to avoid any drama with all those marbles that you keep making reference of because those, those marbles on the outside, if you end up with half a tire on those marbles, you're straight for fence. Six laps remaining. And a closing. 24, 25 k's, isn't it? And a closing margin now, 1.6 seconds between Waters and Reynolds. So David, a tiny bit quicker in the first sector by one tenth, two tenths faster in the mid sector, and one tenth slower in the final sector. So it's just a great arm wrestle of variations between those cars as we go back here and have a look at this interesting battle for 12th and 13th, James Golding versus Todd Hazelwood. This is history repeating, isn't it? This yes. is the drama that we saw earlier when Todd had a big brake lock up and made contact with James Golding at the final corner. Was penalised for it and he's fought his way back, so it's a pretty good drive to get back to the back of that car after that penalty. There's plenty of rubber shaking out from the inner guards out of turn two and three there as well. That needs to be very cautiously negotiated. Brody Kostecki's just done a personal best in sector one. Uh, the reason is he's got Brock right on him. Only 0.8 of a second up the road now, Brody on Brock. So he's continued to show good speed. So he's found some giddy up now just to protect that position. Laps time in the race so far, an hour and three quarters. Remembering that we've had one safety car intervention right off the bat in the opening lap. A bit surprised that we haven't had one since. Normally this place, you'll find somebody makes a mistake trying to thread between the concrete particularly as things get wild, as the track gets all dirty offline. So that lap there, 20.75 for Waters, 20.5, so two and a half tenths of a second, Reynolds has been able to take out of that lead. And when you're sitting in Cam Waters' seat, and you're in this commanding position now towards the back end, it's like, can you just not do that to me? He yeah. Just, he doesn't want... I don't want to play this game right now. It all feels good. I'm in a rhythm. I've got the lead. We just call it quits. And then I've got a pest who's just slowly eking time out of you. And that can be when you find yourself at risk as well, because then if you try and change the rhythm and there's nothing left on the table with pace in the car, then you can start to lock a brake, run a little bit wide. So this is not done. Still five laps remaining or less now. They're about to get to the control line again. But David's just got a bit of a lurking pressure on him there at the moment. He's got a big incentive to close out his chapter with this team strongly. He did it a few weeks ago at Surface Paradise. He's trying to do the same thing again here now. Both of them did well there. You're going to see Brock Fanny right behind. There he is. Yeah. And he's within a car length now of Brody. What's Brody do? Oh, he ran he wide. Little, well, he ran wide. He locked the rear wheels, didn't he? He couldn't get it turned in. But does he... I mean, I don't think you should fight now. You should just put the white flag out. Rest control to all teams. Bad sportsmanship flags to car 99 and 34 for exceeding track limits. Yeah, so Brody looked like he could have exceeded then and he's just been given the bad sportsmanship flag. Good. Too much pressure on him here at the moment from Brock Feeney. So the last thing he needs is any sort of penalty. I probably should tell him that just to 
in shore. You have a bad spot for some flag, you have a bad spot for some flag, so no more curve hopping. Let him go if you need to. Your yeah. championship today, worry about the other one tomorrow. Yeah, so that's George on the radio, doing exactly what you were just describing. He was waiting until he got out of the tricky bit of the racetrack so he could talk to him in a straight line. And uh, only just stopping in time down there at turn nine was Brock. He had the rear brakes locked when he got to the slow part of the stop and he skates through. That's very Here sensible. So there's been showers all around, but they've been avoiding the racetrack today. But it does look darker out there at the moment. How's that with three laps to go? Another little curve ball just to keep everybody biting their nails. So bad sportsmanship flag for Jack LeBrock and for Brody Kostecki here on screen. Brody now moves back into sixth place. It's all academic. He only needs to walk away here tonight, plus 150 points, which he's well and truly done over Shane Van Gisbergen, who came here as our reigning champion. And we've now got a champ elect on the right-hand side of screen at the back end of this one. And it'll be formally celebrated tomorrow afternoon but we're winding down to a pretty big moment in that man's career right there. Car number 99, the Coca-Cola racing entry. How's that? What a cool shot. Isn't it? It's got it all crossed up. Maximum attack into turn one with the tail wagging. Race control to all teams. Bad sportsmanship flag to car 88 for exceeding track limits. Rob Feeney. 1.4 seconds the gap now. Waters Reynolds. Those two still in maximum attack mode, but I think Cam now has been able to, on that lap, for example, just pretty well equalise. I'm looking at the splits between both drivers across all three sectors, and in sector one, it was a tenth in favour of Waters. It was a tenth in favour of Reynolds in the second sector, so then it equalised, and then it was about seven one hundredths in favour of Reynolds in the final sector. So Cam's just stepped it up enough to flatten that margin now got it stable in the last couple of laps. But it does bode well for a ripping race tomorrow when you've got these two so close. Yeah. Remember, you've taken Matt Payne out of play. And Van Gisbergen. And, and Will Brown. Yeah. So you've got three serious contenders and probably we've parked up Anton Di Pasquale with a mechanical drama all day. And if you're Brody and you're off the hook and you've already won the championship, then you can press on. figure out what isn't working well enough on that car. Tune her up tonight and let rip. Yeah, nice rhythmic control here for Cam Waters. 1.3 seconds the margin as we wind down part one of the Velo Adelaide 500. It's the 27th of 28 races in the championship for the Repco Supercars Championship well, at 23. Well, so he's got 3.2 kilometres to run really fought hard today with a strong car good strategy and building beautifully off the back of that great run on the Gold Coast where he was the winner on Saturday remembering that he did very well here in years gone by as well so we know that he's got some great strengths on street circuits the runner up here in 2019 he had a pole here last year as well and a nice moment here for Tim Edwards as he prepares to say farewell to Tickford after a very long and successful reign in that team. Been some beautiful drives this afternoon. Waters, Reynolds, Randall, all of them have done ripping jobs out there and have been able to negotiate a highly challenging racetrack. That margin continued to crush down, but part of that will be Cam just starting to roll out of it now. So he was slower in the first couple of sectors, but they can barely breathe inside the Erebus garage. What a moment for them. So Waters is going to win this, and he is going to win his third race of 2023. But quickly the focus will drop back to Brody Kostecki. Cam Waters fires out the other side, gives Ford fans plenty to cheer about on the streets of Adelaide. Great drive. But what about the story for our hard for Brody Kostecki. There he is in the background. He only just turned 26 a few weeks ago. He's going to be racing in the US next weekend, and he is now the champ elect for the Repco Supercars Championship of 2023.
and in 98th career race in supercars for Brody Kostecki. The biggest moment of his career. Brody Kostecki has done the job. Just reward for an excellent campaign this year for Brody. So for George Commons, for Betty Clemenko, George is the engineer. Nathan Kays is in the background, the manager for Brody, and Larko's in amongst it. Yeah, I'm really keen to chat. I want to get in there and have a chat to my mate. Hey, George, come in here, mate. Um, what a magnificent moment. This is a long, long journey to get here. It means the world to you, know. Talk to us about Brody the driver, mate. You have said things to me before. Let's tell the crowd about him now. How do you You work with guys that are in F1. Tell us about Brody. Oh, he's, he's world class. He's definitely the best one I've ever worked with. And, yeah, I just can't say. As many, so many good things for him, but this whole team this year has been amazing. Um, fantastic to get it done. George, you're not an emotional guy. <laughs> Tell me why you're emotional right now. Why does this mean so much to you? It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've been doing this 20 years, and this is this is the most special moment ever. But for me, for Brody, for the whole team. Um, it's just so much hard work. It's such a hard series. It's just fantastic. Beautiful, mate. I want to give you a hug. Fantastic. Hey, Barry. I haven't got the words, mate, but, you know, this has been a tough few years, a young team, a lot of mistakes, you had to be hard, you got criticised, but it's a tough game, right? And wow, the reward of them bringing it to this level, what you have done this year strategically, engineering-wise, pit stop, strategy, the full package, where wow, you must be proud. Yeah, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, they're, they're really, really proud. Brody's just the best driver. I, I can't explain how good he is. Everybody's seen it this year, but he's just amazing. He's just the effort he puts into his racing, if every other driver did that, they'd be the same, but they don't. Barry, from the moment, though, that you hit the... From the moment, there he comes, you go and do your thing, mate. No, I'm going to let you go and do your thing. You go and do your thing. Yeah, great words. Thank you, Mark Larkham. Very special moment for Barry Ryan, who's been in this business for a long period of time. And this is a special moment to savour for Brody Kostecki taking nothing away from the drive this afternoon for Cam Waters, for Monster Energy and for Tickford. But this championship year is all about Brody Kostecki. changing day for that young man and what a future he has his team has performed unbelievably and so is that young man with him his teammate will brown who was out early in the race today they've both been superb this year extraordinary results for the team and what a day for Brody kostecki meantime in protect victory lane big reaction also for cam waters Welcome relief for him, for his group. Thomas Randall in there as well, getting on the podium today. It's a one and three for Tickford. That'll give Tim Edwards something to smile about. And a beautiful drive today also for David Reynolds. So lots of reasons for everybody in the business to be smiling out there at the moment. A great day for Ford, a great day for Waters, for Reynolds, for Randall, and a very special day for Brody Kostecki. He's handled himself very well this year throughout the championship, Brody Kostecki. He's been under extreme amounts of pressure. There's been some beautiful drives, but right now we celebrate a great moment also for Cam Waters and a big comeback run in the back end of the championship for him. It certainly is. Cameron Waters has been chasing this consistency all season. Congratulations, your first ever win here on the streets of Adelaide. Just tell us what this one means to be able to finish the year on such a high for you, for your outgoing team principal, Tim Edwards, and all the fans here who've been riding the Mustang all year long. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm lost for words, to be honest. It's been such a shocking year. It wasn't a win in Gold Coast, but, um, you know, to win here in Adelaide, it's probably one of my favourite races of the year. The fans are amazing. Um, my team have been... Absolutely phenomenal and um, can't thank all my sponsors. And to win with a Ken Block livery and to blow the rear tyres off it was um, very, very special. So, yeah, I'm pretty pumped. Um, all my family's here and whatnot. Dad's homesick, so get well soon, Dad. 
Tell us about the car today. It was a jet. It just seemed like it got faster and faster as the race went on. Yeah, it was um, it was amazing. It's probably the best car. Tick for to give me, to be honest. So um, just really good the second half of the stint. That's where I got all my lap time. And awesome to have a pretty cool battle with Davey. And great to come out on top. Go and celebrate it, Cam. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's now three podiums in a row for David Reynolds, who gave it everything today, but didn't quite have enough to match it with Cam Waters. Davey, congratulations. Tell me what this one means to you, to the team, considering you're on your way out of this team. <laughs> yeah, I know. I keep reminding myself, just as we start going good. Um, yeah, no, it was a really good race. Uh, you know, I had a good, good battle with everyone, good battle with Cam, good battle with, um, uh, sorry, Randall and Brody as well. Sorry? Tommy, Tommy T. Randall, yeah. But uh, it was all right, like hit Waters car was just heaps quicker than me. But I think I know what we need to do tomorrow to get the win. So today I'm obviously, you know, happy to be second, but uh, I wish I won, won that race because, uh, you know, but he was really good by, awesome job by everyone at um, Penwright Racing. They've done a fantastic job all weekend. All their cars have been fast and uh, yeah, really looking forward to tomorrow. So tell us, what are you going to do to make it faster for tomorrow and win? I know what to do, but I can't tell you yet. I'll tell you tomorrow. How's that? Come ask me tomorrow if I won, I'll tell you what I did. I'll do. Congratulations, Dave. All right. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Dave. And there's something about Thomas Randall and South Australia because he's a master <laughs> here. Congratulations. Back on the podium. What a result for you and for Tickford Racing today. Unbelievable. I mean, congrats to Cam. Like, he drove faultlessly and so good for the whole team. Double podium here at the 500 and great for the, you know, the Ken Block livery and... Um, yeah, he was catching me there and I uh, got the call to, well, look, it was just obvious to do that and, um, you know, no hesitation and he went on to pass Davey and just controlled the race and, yeah, the, the pit stops are followed from the guys and so good to get the Castro Mustang back on the podium. Always wanted to get on the podium here. Hopefully we can go a couple of spots better tomorrow, but yeah, two ticket cars on the podium is pretty special. Congratulations, Tom. Go and enjoy the celebration. Thanks, Jess. I sure will. OK, let's have a look at our results at the end of the second last race of the championship year and Cam Waters gets it done by a pretty tiny margin in the end. He rolled out of it from David Reynolds. Thomas Randall, you just heard from, beautiful drive from him this afternoon. Great charging drive also for Chaz Mostert to get back up into fourth position and followed by Brock Feeney, Brody Kostecki, who comes home as our champ elect, followed by Will Davis and James Courtney and Andre Heimgartner, Scott Pye. Nice work as well. And Shane Van Gisbergen, sad to see his name out so early in that race together with Will Brown. And pretty substantial damage. So, points-wise, the aim of the game was for Brody to get away from here with more than 150 points in his back pocket if he was to stitch up the championship. Well, he's done that. You can see it's 233, that margin. But interestingly, there's been a move up one position by Brock Feeney. BP Ultimate Performance Moment. This man, beautiful drive this afternoon, building off the back of the Gold Coast. Great elation there. You heard him talk about the fact that it's been a tough deal. Rough start the early part of the year and smiling Tim delivers with an ear-to-ear -ear grin for us. Trudy jumping up and down there as well. And a nice Ken Block burnout at the back end. So the performance moment powered by BP Ultimate.